Hi. Hi. Thank you, Yasmina. Hi, everyone. So let me just start by showing you an agenda for today. These are the topics that I'm going to cover. Um, first, we're going to talk about what are business requirements, and I'm going to relate them to other types of requirements for you. And then we'll talk through four scoping models based on those business requirements. Uh, and finally, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about how do we use all this information so we can control scope on our project. Uh, I'm going to also mention to you that most of the content today is right out of the third edition of Software Requirements, which I co-authored that with Carl Wiegers. So um, Chapter 5 is the focus in that book and what we're going to talk about today. Let's set the stage for talking about business requirements. There's a relatively famous study out there called, um, by the Standish Group, and it shows that most projects are actually failing. And the main reason that those projects are failing are up here on the, uh, the slide. So lack of user input, changing requirements, incomplete requirements, and unclear objectives. These tell us that there's something wrong with the relationship between our business stakeholders and IT, and how we're executing projects. So business requirements are at the heart of defining what our business stakeholders really need. Business requirements are so important because they define our objectives so they're clear. They're going to help us manage those changing requirements. They're going to help us identify requirements that might be incomplete. And they can help us understand where we need to go get user input. So again, business requirements are really the crux at the crux of successful or even failed projects. So they're that important in our projects. So what are they? Um, there's a very simple definition on your slide here. They are basically a set of information that, in aggregate, describes a need that leads to one or more projects that will ultimately help us deliver a solution and the desired ultimate you know, business outcomes. Really everything we do in projects is about how do we deliver business outcomes, but business requirements help us understand what are those needs and then what does the solution look like that gets us to those outcomes. So essentially, they describe why the organization is implementing the system that they're implementing. And with it, they're going to describe what are the benefits that that business is helping, hoping to get out of the project. You know, I find when I go from customer to customer that people use the term business requirements differently. So I like to put business requirements in perspective relative to other types of requirements that are maybe a bit more commonly understood um, or at least uniformly understood, I'll say. So there's three levels of software requirements that all relate to one another, and those are the ones you see here. Business requirements are going to be at the top of the chain. User requirements are right below that, and then functional requirements are below those in the hierarchy. So the user requirements and the functional requirements have to align back to our business requirements. Um, of course, there's other types of requirements that I don't show here, things like non-functional requirements or quality attributes. Um, just for simplicity, I'm not putting them in here, but they could potentially uh, drop in at any different level. But again, the essence of it is business requirements are why the organization is undertaking the project, user requirements are what the users will be able to do with the system, and functional requirements are what the developer implements. Um, and again, with this hierarchy, what it means is that if you have a functional requirement at that lowest level that doesn't help the project achieve its business objectives, then simply put, it should not get developed. Here are a couple examples of those. Um, I, all of the examples that I'm going to give today are for a sample project where we would be building a chemical tracking system. So at the top level, we have a really clear objective that tells us why are we building the system. All right, so in this particular case, it's to reduce chemical purchasing expenses by 25% in the first year. The user requirement that I've got up here um, is written very much like a user story from the Agile world. Um, doesn't have to be used in Agile projects, but I think it's a nice clean way you can state user requirements. And it explains what the user desires. In this case, right, as a chemist, I want to request a chemical so that I can perform experiments. And then our corresponding functional requirement level is just one simple statement about what the system must do to support that user requirement. So in this one, uh, let's say we're building a portal as part of our system. The porter sh portal shall use a shopping cart to contain chemicals that the user selects to order. So again, those are just three very, very simple examples from one project so you can see it very top all the way down to the lowest level. Now, business requirements I mentioned are an aggregation of a few types of information. So these are those four types of information. Business opportunities, business objectives, success metrics, vision statements. Um, I'm going to look at each of these one by one in a bit more detail and give you an example of each of these. 
So first off, we have business opportunities. For a corporate system, um, this is going to be your business problem, the thing that the business is trying to solve, um, or maybe it's a process that's being improved. right? For a commercial product, it might look a little different. It could be the business opportunity that exists in the market in which the product will be competing. Um, we can ask questions like, you know, what's keeping the organization from reaching its goals, or what are the opportunities in the marketplace, to try and identify, um, to try and elicit these opportunities from the executives on our projects. So in our chemical tracking system, an example of a business problem might be something like managing chemical inventories manually costs too much and is inefficient. All right, so that's the problem that leads us to build this chemical tracking system. A business objective is the second part of our business requirements information. A business objective is the benefit that an organization expects to receive from a project. Um, these really do have to be written in a quantitative and measurable way. Uh, and I believe that they actually always can be related back to money, at least at the top level of an organization. So in a business context, this usually means something like relating it to revenue, maybe an increase in revenue, or an increase in profit, or potentially a cut in costs. But the key there is it's all about the money. Um, sometimes we have to use proxies for money. It could be things like, you know, I want to increase the number of customers to my site, knowing that that would lead to more revenue, or the number of units sold, or something like that. Ultimately, though, that's the key. They are going to relate back to money. Um, and, and the common argument I hear is, well, what about compliance projects or regulatory projects? Um, uh, people think that they don't relate to money, but they do, because ultimately we do those projects so that we can either avoid fines or simply just so we can stay in business, right? So we can always relate those back pretty easily. Now, sometimes we hear about IT projects where you know, we're trying to combine seven different systems into one system. Um, let's be clear, combining seven systems into one, that is not a business objective. Um, it may be a solution to a problem, but the business never cares. They literally just do not care about whether they have seven systems or one system. They need to see what is the obvious dollar benefit associated with that um, to really buy into wanting to do a project like that. And then up here again, you see an example for a chemical tracking system. Uh, one objective might be to reduce chemical purchasing expenses from $1 million to $750,000 in the first year. Now, organizations generally undertake a project to solve a problem or exploit an opportunity. Um, so the objectives that we write have to relate back to those opportunities. Uh, when we look closer at what's keeping us from achieving our objectives, that's where we can find more problems. Um, and I, I guess the point I want to make here is that this is an iterative process. It's not that you go find one problem and one objective and now you're done. Um, they actually help inform each other. So to identify objectives, if you already have some idea what the business problem is, then you can ask things like, well, how are we going to assess whether that problem is solved? That's going to help us write a very clear, clean objective statement. Um, you also, if you have objectives, can ask things like, what's keeping us from achieving the goal? To identify maybe a more detailed problem that gets into the details of what we really have to do in the system. Um, or we can work backward by asking, you know, why do we even care about that goal? And we can maybe better understand the top level business problems. Now, this is going to sound really simple, and I realize it's not, but to elicit good business objectives, you must get with the right stakeholders, that's the first part that's hard, <laughs> Um, and you need to continuously ask them why until you under, uncover what are those real problems um, that they're trying to solve, what are the real objectives that they're trying to achieve. Right? So you're going to ask why over and over and over again. Why is that a problem? Well, why do you care about doing that? Well, why, why do you need to do that? And that question can take various forms. But the point is that is really what you have to do. I'm going to say that's all there is to eliciting these. Again, easier said than done. Um, sometimes it's hard to get the stakeholders and sometimes it's hard um, because people don't know the answers, and so you really have to ask it in different ways to dig it up. All right, the third um, component here is going to be our success metrics. Often we have really nice business objectives. Um, the catch is that, that maybe they can't be measured until well after our project is complete. Um, an example I just gave you was, you know, let's say in the first year I want to see a reduction in cost. Well, I can't measure that until basically a year after I launch the project. So for that reason, we like to define interim success metrics to help us know, you know, is our project on track to meet those objectives? 
Success metrics are something that can be tracked uh, as the project progresses and then maybe during testing or shortly after release. This timeline here demonstrates that you know, we start a project and then maybe we have a few interim metrics that tell us, yep, we're on track. Then we launch our project. And maybe we do a few more measurements, these success metrics, um, to see if we're still on track, eventually we get to a point where we can actually measure the true business objective and see if that was met. Hopefully, if everything's on track, then yes, it would get met. Um, to illustrate this, again, look at our chemical tracking system. Right. So uh, if we want to reduce um, the costs over the course of a year, then maybe we can look at some interim metric like, can we reduce the time that is spent ordering chemicals to 10 minutes on 80% of the orders? It's a very, very simple metric, but I could test that right after I released the project. I could even probably do some initial tests, you know, either during testing or as I'm building prototypes and things like that. So that's a metric I can look at very, very early. Um, and I'm going to pick metrics like that that help me understand if I do these things, then yes, I should meet my overall objective. And then the fourth component to our business requirements is going to be a vision statement. Vision statements describe the product that's ultimately um, going to achieve the business objectives. Right? So they paint this picture of where we are all hoping to go on the project. Um, it helps align the priorities and all the activities of literally all the stakeholders, right? from the business all the way through IT. Let's all get on the same page about where we're going. So it gives us a common goal or a common objective that we can drive after. Uh, vision statements include a concise summary of the uh, long-term purpose and intent of the project. Now, I think sometimes when we write them, they sound idealistic, but we need to make sure that they're grounded in realities. Right? What do we expect to happen in the market, or what do we expect to happen in our organization um, with our enterprise architecture, with our, where the corporate strategy is going? We've got to keep all those things in mind when we write our vision. Now, you can also... Um, you don't have to just do this on your own, right? You can encourage maybe get a group of stakeholders together uh, in a room and have them all draft their own vision statements for the product. That will help you very quickly realize where people may be misaligned. Um, it's kind of a neat activity to go through and um, bring out where are those differences and try and get everybody on the same page then to write one concise vision statement together. The other thing I will tell you, even if you're well into your project, it's never too late to do this exercise. Uh, what you will do is you will probably uncover some lack of focus or lack of direction sooner than later, and so you can fix it uh, before it became a problem down the road. <clears throat> Next up, I've got the um, kind of the format for our vision statement. There's a very simple template that you can follow and use in all your different vision statements. So. What we do is we're just going to walk through these key, key components. But first thing we're going to describe is who is the product targeted at, right? Who's going to use the system? Um, maybe in the market, right? What's your audience that you're targeting? What is the need or the opportunity? What's driving us to do this thing? Uh, we're going to look at what is the actual product called, right? How are we going to all commonly refer to it in our example? You know, that might be the chemical tracking system. Uh, what type of product is it? What are the major capabilities or key benefits or reasons to buy? Here you might describe what are the key features that you're going to implement. You know, how does it differentiate from other solutions out there or other products in the market, maybe other solutions that you're thinking about building? And then a concise statement about the value of the product. Right? Now, I will tell you when you write vision statements the first time through, you may not do all of these pieces. That's okay. At least try or at least start to do something to move yourself towards having a nice, concise statement like this. And here's an example. This is part of the example from our chemical tracking system. If I put the entire thing up here on your screen, your eyes are going to gloss over, right? Uh, it would take far too long. So I just want you to get a little bit of a flavor for what kinds of things we would put in a vision statement. So for example, here we have you know, four scientists that's our target for using this product, who need to request containers of chemicals. Um, the what here, the chemical tracking system, is an information system. And it's going to provide a single point of access to the chemical stock room and to vendors, and so on. So you kind of get the idea from that, I hope. The vision statement that we write really applies to the product as a whole. Um, the overall vision should change relatively slowly as a product's strategic positioning or a company's business objectives evolve over time. That thing probably isn't going to change dramatically is what I'm saying. However, there's this concept of scope, um, and that is a little bit different. Uh, the concept of spoke, scope is it pertains to like a specific project or maybe an iteration within a project um, that 
that's going to implement the next increment of the overall vision. So I've got this whole product out there, and I'm going to kind of divide it up into scope releases. And those releases could be two weeks, those releases could be quarters, it could be year. None of that matters here. The point is that you are ultimately rolling out what that product looks like over time. Um, scope is more dynamic, dynamic than vision because the stakeholders adjust the contents of each release within a schedule, budget, resources, you know, whatever constraints they have to work with. Um, scope for your current release is going to look clear, but as you go down the time horizon to future releases, that scope is going to be much fuzzier the further out you look. Um, the, this outlook, by the way, that I'm talking about is absolutely applicable whether you're doing something in Waterfall or Agile or some other incremental iterative approach to development. It doesn't matter. This statement is still true. Again, the difference is maybe in Agile, each of these little blacks is a sprint, um, and in Waterfall, it's literally a major release of a product. Um, so in any of these approaches, whatever you would do to build a roadmap for subsequent releases, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And again, the real point is that your scope is going to be fuzzier as you get further to the right. All right, now I'm going to dive into four different scoping models that we're going to work with, and all of them certainly are going to get tied back to those business requirements. <clears throat> Even with a solid product vision, um, the reality is the product's going to fail if you don't manage that scope. So we're going to talk about all four of these models in detail. If you have defined um, clear business requirements, everything within these four models should map back to those business requirements. Those have got to be um, tied together, okay? And the collection of the business requirements in these four scope models is going to help you put a clear boundary around what's going on in your project. So now, like I said, we're going to dive into each of these and give you an example on all of them. All right, the first scope model is our context diagram. It defines a scope boundary on the system and its connections to all the external entities that interface to the system in some way, right? So the system is typically shown in a circle. Um, that's going to be usually in the center of your diagram. And it encompasses uh, hardware, could be software, and it could even be people, human components that interface with the system. The boxes are those external entities that do the interfacing with the system. And this could be, like I said, other systems, it could be hardware, it could be other groups of users, um, maybe a particular role, for example, could show up in those boxes. And the lines are going to show the data or the physical objects that flow and the direction of that flow between the external entity and the system. You know, some people look at this diagram and they think of it as being like a top-level data flow diagram because you can show data or information flowing from a system through its interfaces. Um, this model only shows the entities that directly relate with the system, and that's a key difference between the model that we're going to see in a moment. So basically I'm looking at here's my system and who directly interfaces with it, either automated or manually and I'm not going to show anything outside of that limitation. So um, that's a key difference, and I will highlight it again here in a couple slides when we look at another model. So let's look at an example from our chemical tracking system. In this case, the buyer is an external entity, and for a moment, let's assume it's a person. Um, she takes the vendor chemical request from the system and does something with it. All right, and you're going to see that kind of over here in the upper left corner. That's your buyer, and she's got data flowing out of the system to her. Um, and then she, or maybe the system that she uses, is going to pass a vendor order status back to the system. Right? So she's managing the relationship with the vendor and actually doing the buying. And what this is showing us is what the chemical tracking system has to hand her and receive from her um, throughout the course of those interactions. A very simple diagram to read when you see it, I think. And one of the tips I would say on this is that when you're putting labels on these lines, you're going to want to keep it as simple as you can, right? There's a, there could be lots of different things that are getting passed between these. These are the major pieces of data or major physical objects that are being passed around. You would not specify all the individual fields on a diagram like this. Our second scope model is the ecosystem map. This model illustrates for us all the systems related to the system that we are developing. The boxes are systems, and the arrows are going to show, again, the same thing, major data that's flowing between the systems and the direction of that flow. The key difference between this and the context diagram is that um, only systems is that it only shows systems um, 
whereas the context diagram shows like potentially the people or the groups of people. So in the ecosystem app, we're only going to have systems on the diagram. The other thing is that the ecosystem map shows systems that maybe aren't directly interfacing to your system. Um, they may be systems that influence it indirectly, and I will explain that in a minute what I mean by that. Okay? But that's a key difference is I might have a lot more systems on this diagram that don't show up um, in the other one. And what this diagram does for us is it helps us understand all the interfaces that we have to develop, but it also shows us the downstream and the upstream impacts of what our system might be. So for example, um, if data gets passed into your system from another, um, let's say you do something to that data and you pass it to another system, and that system in turn passes it onto another system. Okay? We're now talking about two systems removed, but we don't directly interface with that system that's two systems away. Yet what we're doing inside of our system could impact that system later. Right? So if I need to set some particular fields or pass some information to the system I am talking to so that it can correctly correspond with the next system, I need to know that when I'm doing my requirements. Okay? So that's why we put those kinds of um, systems that are not directly related to ours still in this diagram is they may impact our requirements. Once I um, follow the data flow and I see that I'm not passing data um, or influencing data that gets past the systems that are further removed, that's how I know I can stop putting them in my diagram. So to create one of these, we're going to look for affected systems by following that data, where does it get consumed, and where is the data produced that is used in our system. Um, and the nature of this diagram is that you are going to have some overlap between what you show in here and what you show in the context diagram that we just looked at a minute ago. There's absolutely going to be overlap because we're both showing systems that we directly interface with in those. This is part of an ecosystem map for the chemical tracking system. Um, so you can see uh, right in the middle we've got our chemical tracking system, and it passes something called requests to the purchasing system and that system passes orders to a vendor. So even though the chemical tracking system doesn't talk directly to the vendor, we benefit here by showing that the request turns into an order that goes to the vendor, because that might help us know to include certain data fields in that request that will ultimately have to get passed on to um, the vendor later. So that's a, just an example of um, what kind of sort of indirect influence that we might have over other systems. Our third scoping model is a feature tree. So it depicts the product's features that are organized into logical groups. We hierarchically show them. Um, and we're going to subdivide features into further detail. Um, so the product is in the oval and on that kind of main branch. Um, the top level features, we call those L1 features or level 1 features. They're going to be shown here in boxes, like the blue box on your screen. And then we have sub-features to the L1. Those are L2 features. Okay? All of those are going to show up off the L1 branch. And then we have L3 features, which are going to be off the L2 branches. So this right here is a very small snippet of a template, and it shows you three different levels of features. So that's how we get our hierarchy of features into a very, very simple view. Uh, we like it. It's a nice, concise view, because you can actually fit the entire project usually in one page. It doesn't mean you can't split it up, but the idea is that you could have a one-page view that shows literally all of the functionality that's going to get built in the system. And I'm going to tell you that executives love this because it's that one-page view. Um, it gives them a quick overview of what they can expect is going to come out of the project. And then the other thing you can do with this is you can actually highlight different features as maybe being in scope or out of scope on the tree using things like patterns or colors in this case. I've got green that's maybe showing us, hey, this is what we're going to have in scope, and then there may be some other colors that show us what's out of scope for a particular um, release that we're in. And here's the example from our chemical tracking system. Um, we have the order chemicals L1 feature with uh, search and chemical requests as L2 features. Um, and then there's many more L3 features. Notice you know, some of the branches are green, like order chemicals, because we want to include them in our initial release. But then others are slated for later releases, um, and maybe they're just left in black right now. Or we could add another color that shows you know, here's release one, a different color that shows release two, and then things that are in black are just never going to be in scope as they're defined right now. So again, you can do some creative things with coloring or some kind of patterns on those lines of colors, if you're going to print in black and white, for example. 
Um, but the idea is, generally speaking here, I'm showing here is all the different features that we are going to put into our chemical tracking system or that we could put in and what we're planning to put in. So really, really popular model um, early on in a project to, to give that overview. All right, the event list is our fourth scope model. It identifies the external events that could trigger behavior in the system. Now, it might reflect actions or business events taken by external entities in a context diagram. Um, it could be things taken, like actors and use cases, actions that they take. Um, it could be systems in our ecosystem that, that are triggering behavior in our system. It also could be reflective of temporal or time-triggered events. Um, things that happen at a particular time or after a certain amount of time. All right, so we're going to come up with this entire list of what are all the different events, and then we can use this to manage our scope by allocating events to different releases. And here is an example again of our chemical tracking system event list. This is actually part of an event list. There would be many more events. Um, but example events are going to be things like, you know, a chemist is placing a request, or a vendor indicates um, there's a back order. Or there could be a timing event that's something like it's time to generate an OSHA compliance report. So notice on this how we've used uh, brackets to indicate what's in scope for this release or others, right? So we've got the initial release in green and then everything else in orange. Um, you could also do this by, you know, adding a column that indicates a release number in some particular way. Uh, if you're in an agile world, you could put these things in a backlog even and somehow you know, prioritize those with your stories um, the same way. Just let the things trickle to the top that are most important. All right, that um, covers our four scope models. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about how we use these together so that we can control scope. So first, wait for the slide to come up, there we go. Um, if you were to create business requirements and put them in a document, like a business requirements document or a vision and scope document, those are kind of common names we see out there, that's a great start. But here's the catch. Don't assume that people are going to read the documents, and more importantly, even if they do, don't assume that they're going to remember what was in it. Okay? So your job um, isn't just about, hey, let me go elicit all this information and dump in a document and check it off a list, okay? Just because you put in the document doesn't mean people understand it or remember what it was. So, a couple suggestions. When you're doing a licitation, you could actually actively remind people what is the scope. And you could do it at the beginning of every single meeting. So, for um, example, you know, actually display it or have printouts of, hey, everybody, remember this is that model that we are working on, okay? Now, um, we actually start a lot of our elicitation meetings by showing here are the business objectives just really quickly. You don't even have to spend more than a minute on it. And you would say something like, you know, this is just a reminder of what we're trying to accomplish. And when st someone starts to suggest something that seems odd, maybe outside the scope boundary, we just bring out the appropriate model and we check. We do it right there. So you can actively start to um, control the scope during your elicitation sessions. Um, the other thing that you can do is if your team is co-located in the same place, you can actually make big printouts of these scope models and your business objectives and hang them on the wall. So everybody's walking by them every day. Right? I, I know one organization that did this, and it was nice, literally every day everybody saw the business objectives. And it's just keeping the entire team razor sharp focused on what we're trying to deliver. And again, doing this, right, everybody will know at a quick glance what's in or out of scope, um, and, and you can, you know, very quickly get them on board with, yep, you're right, that didn't match the scope, we should probably cut it before you even start the analysis on it. Now, of course, cutting unnecessary so scope at the beginning presumes that we actually did define good business requirements as a basis um, for controlling scope. I guess that's kind of a given. Um, but if you do have business good, require, good business requirements, which I'm pretty sure you're all going to after this presentation, I hope, <laughs> then you can use them to determine what requirements should be in or out of scope. Um, actually pretty easily. I'm going to say easy in quotes there. But the business objectives are going to be the most important factor in deciding you know, what kind of scoping decisions we should be making. So the idea is we can actually define those scope boundaries and then we can actually quantify the value of the requirements and just cut the stuff that doesn't add the benefit. 
um, or at least delay it for later releases, worst case. And you're going to continue to do this throughout your project duration. So this iterative cycle will happen over and over and over again, okay? Now the key here is, um, and this is an important thing, hopefully you guys all get this, is that just because something was within your scope boundary doesn't mean it falls within the project's budget or time frame. Okay, so we need something further that's going to help us make that determination. So even though I look at my diagram and I say, yep, that's in scope, that doesn't mean it's actually in scope for my project. There may be a, too many things that are in scope, for example, for the project duration or for the budget that I have, or even for what I really truly need to do. So this is a model that's going to help us with that. It's called an objective chain, and it ties requirements back to business objectives. Um, and we assign a benefit to each requirement or set of requirements or features, for example. Um, these are basically links in a hierarchy then that tell us how much do those requirements contribute to the overall business objective. And once we do that, we can select and eliminate requirements based on facts rather than emotions. Right? So I've got the executive who's saying, I have to have this feature. Now you're going to have the facts that show, okay, does that particular feature add enough value that yes, we should include it, or nope, we really shouldn't. Okay. So we evaluate each requirement or set of requirements to determine you know, how much is it going to contribute to that business objective. Um, I do suggest that you group your requirements together so you're only doing this uh, kind of a comparison on something like 10 to 20 things. Um, otherwise, you're going to drive yourself up a wall with analysis. Um, it's just going to be too much probably. Uh, and when you're doing this analysis, you don't have to be precise. We're just trying to get a rough order of magnitude on that quantification. So for example, specific requirement um, you know, we can determine does it contribute $1,000 or $10,000 or $500,000 or maybe it's a million dollars towards that business objective. So we're getting rough orders of magnitude of how valuable the requirements are relative to one another. And you can use the same concept um, throughout your project duration. So when an executive requests this new feature, and he thought, um, you know, he, he thought about it over the weekend, or maybe his friend in another company is doing it. And he comes into your desk and he says, I need you to add this feature. You can say, you know what, let me run that through our objective chain model and figure out what it looks like. You're going to come up with a value, and you're going to go back and have that conversation about, look, you can have this, but here's why you maybe shouldn't. Or, hey, that was a great find. Look how much this is going to help us, and we can actually cut something else. So, kind of a complicated model. I'm going to walk you through an example, though. For our chemical tracking system, um, once again, and, and I've picked out just a couple simple requirements here. It's never actually this simple because you'll have more things. But for our chemical tracking system, imagine we have uh, two different high-level requirements like stockroom inventory recording and then chemical inventory images or chemical container images. The stockroom inventory recording that is used so that the system knows what's actually in the stockroom, and that can be compared to the lab request for chemicals. Right? So I have a chemist who says they need a chemical. Well, the system knows what's actually in the stockroom, so we know if we have it or not. Um, so I can avoid buying things unnecessarily. Now, the chemical images, those are images of the actual containers. So maybe you know, we can look at you know, the lab assistant says, I need a chemical. They pull up in the system. They see it's already in the stock room. They can actually do a visual by looking at that image to say, hey, are we requesting the right thing? Is that look what I, like what I actually need? Or maybe um, without that, I don't know and I end up buying the wrong thing. Now, let's think back for a minute. A um, number of slides ago, we talked about our objective, and in this case, it was to cut expenses by $250,000 over the first year. Okay, So looking at the stockroom um, inventory recording, all right, we can see how that contributes to our business objectives, because if the lab assistant knows what's in the stockroom, they can avoid buying things that are already in stock. Right? That would be the unnecessary purchases. So. Not buying chemicals that are already in stock can save us, on average, $200 per chemical. Right? And we have to assume in this particular case, that's data that they already have. And we know that last year, we bought about 500 chemicals unnecessarily. Do the math there, and that gets us to a $100,000 benefit out of this one requirement. Right? So that gets us a pretty significant savings. And again, I use some assumptions there, things like, on average, $200 per chemical. Um, or on average, or last year, you know, we bought 500 unnecessarily. Those are 
in this particular case, we'd have to assume the organization has that kind of data to tell us where the problem was originally that even led us down this path. Um, sometimes you're going to have to make assumptions, and that's just the nature of doing this kind of a model. If you have to make assumptions, like maybe I'm assuming it was 500 chemicals, I want to document that assumption so everybody knows, hey, this is an assumption. You know, everybody check it. Do you, do you agree with it or disagree with it and why? But also, more importantly then, as we go to launch this system or as we get more data in, we can track to see, wow, were we wrong about it? And if we were wrong, that changes this whole equation. Um, so we'd want to go back and update it, in which case we may deprioritize something or reprioritize something. So it allows us to be at least honest about what assumptions we're making and then track them to see what the impact of those assumptions might have been. Okay, similarly, um, Let's talk now about the container images, right? These images help users so that they're not making accidental purchases because they can see the thing and recognize that chemical container. This only happens though about 50 times a year where we bought something that was, or we thought we had something or we didn't have it, we didn't recognize it. Okay, so it's not nearly as frequent that this kind of mistake happens. Um, still is the same cost when we um, look at an average of $200 per chemical. So ultimately that gets us to a $10,000 value. It's an order of magnitude lower. And just looking at these two features alone, one of them contributes to the overall objective significantly, the other one doesn't, right? So if we're looking for $250,000 um, gain, then that $10,000 is so minor that we really should just cut it because the risks associated with building stuff that we don't need, right? The time involved in that, the development, the testing, all those things, it adds up. There's no point in doing all of that if it's not even going to help us get to our overall benefit. So in this particular case, we would probably build one feature and cut the other. And then keep in mind there's another 10, 20 features just like this that we would do the same analysis on. Um, and I will tell you, by the way, this is kind of an interesting side note, that Carl Wiegers, who I co-authored the Software Requirements book with, um, actually has a PhD in organic chemistry, and he, in looking at this example, was very quick to point out the chemicals themselves look like, they're either liquids or powders, and they more or less all look the same. Um, and maybe the containers would be helpful, but in reality, this is just a feature that, you know, probably to somebody who's truly a chemist, is obvious that we wouldn't even need. Okay, so again, very, very simple explanation, but I want to give you a simple explanation of how it works. Um, that we can value those features relative to one another. Now quantifying the value of the features of the requirements helps us to identify you know, how our top level requirements tie back to those business objectives. So that approach that we just went through is great for groups of high level requirements. That said, we still got to make sure we have that traceability throughout the entire requirements hierarchy. Okay? So at the very lowest of levels, any requirement that can't tie back to the business objective, simply put, it's out of scope. Okay? So what might happen is early on in your analysis, you're finding these business requirements. Um, and you've got clean business objectives and your, you know, your top level requirements are all fine, and maybe even your user requirements. Maybe you guys are managing your user stories, and those are all really well prioritized against the business requirements, so that's great. But that next level of detail where we get into the functional requirements, thing, you know, we start to specify things, and they seem like they're such small little increments that you can put a lot of them in there, and it's like, well, as long as we're doing this little thing, we can do this one other little thing too, right? that's how we end up with scope running out of control really, really fast. It's because what feels like a simple, easy little requirement to write down on paper may turn into a lot of development hours, um, potentially a lot of test hours, um, a lot of rework hours and other things, right? So you just don't know. The one simple requirement statement at that functional level may seem harmless, but really, really could be um, detrimental to your project. So it's why you want to be constantly making sure do they map back up through this hierarchy to those business requirements. Now, that is all well and good if your scope never changes <laughs> um, or if the business never changes their mind about the requirements. Um, but I would love to hear about a project where that didn't happen because <laughs> um, the reality is that requirements are going to almost always change. Um, people change their mind or the business needs change, maybe the market changed, it could be anything. So um, the reality is we're going to have to deal with requirements changing. Um, and in my perspective, scope change isn't actually a bad thing because it really can help you steer your project towards satisfying these evolving customer needs. Like that's a positive, right? So I don't feel like we should shy away from change inherently, 
Um, in fact, I'll say Agile is built on the whole you know, concept that change is very, very normal and we embrace it. Um, the key is that we, know, we have to know how to control it, or not really strictly control it per se, but you know, how do we smartly control that change? Um, the key to, to that smart control, as I call it, is to really manage the change in a smart way. Does a, make sure it doesn't derail your project. This means it's things like you know, don't let unnecessary changes happen, certainly. Um, it means you're going to have to make prioritization choices. Or you're going to have to help people make prioritization choices. It also means you're going to have to cut things to add new things sometimes, right? Something new came up, that's great, value add, we need to cut something else. Um, smart control means that we're making educated decisions instead of you know, accidental ones or even emotional ones, which is probably what I see more often than not. So here's kind of the decision process that I think we go through when we're faced with changes. So when someone requests you know, a new requirement, the analyst has to ask, you know, is this in scope? And one, re uh, one response might be that the proposed requirement is clearly out of scope. Um, perhaps it's interesting, but it should be addressed in a future release or by another project, right? Great, capture it and put it in a bucket for later. <laughs> another possibility is that the request obviously lies within the defined project scope, um, and you can incorporate the new in-scope requirement in the project if it's high enough priority relative to other ones. Um, including the requirements, though, often includes making a decision to defer or cancel other planned requirements, unless you're willing to extend something, be it the project's duration or the budget to get more people on board, right? So there's a couple different branches that we can follow here. Um, keep in mind that two of these choices can be very, very expensive. So you need to be careful when you follow those two particular paths. Um, the red ones here are the expensive ones, if that wasn't obvious. Um, so, so in summary, right, newly proposed requirements might fall in scope um, and push those less important or less valuable requirements back out of scope. That's fine. Newly proposed requirements might fall out of scope, but could be valuable enough that you need to widen the scope. So both of those possibilities are very, very real. Um, it's just about making really smart decisions when you do that. All right, that concludes our actual agenda. Um, we've talked about you know, what are business requirements. We've covered four different scope models. Just to reiterate, those are the context diagram, the ecosystem map, the um, event list, and I just totally blanked on the third one, or the fourth one, oh, the feature tree. <laughs> um, and we've talked about how to actively manage um, that scope on your project using these different tools that we've talked about. Here's a couple different resources that might help you if you want to learn a bit more. Uh, again, most of the content that I've talked about today is going to be closely aligned with Chapter 5 in the Software Requirements book that you see here at the top, um, right in the middle. Um, the models that I talked about are covered in the Visual Models book in more depth, right? So first few chapters even, we talk about business objectives, we talk about objective chains, things like this feature tree. So those are going to be covered in a bit more depth with examples in the book on the left. And then on our website, which you can see at the bottom, clevel.com, you're going to find um, a variety of different resources, uh, white papers, and then some templates and things like that that you can download and are welcome to use. So with that, I think we're ready to take some of your questions and see what more you would like to know. Great. And Joy, that was a fabulous presentation you just gave, and we have several questions that have come in. Folks, we are at the Q&A portion. Open the group chat widget right there in your widget tray, click on it, type in your question, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. Okay, we'll take them in the order they came in. Um, Scott would like to know, how is project failure defined? <laughs> That's a really good question, Scott. It's kind of the million dollar question, literally. Um, and I'm going to tell you that, a um, couple answers to that. First of all, I will tell you the people who did the study, the Standards Group, actually go into quite a bit of depth in their study about how they're defining success or failure. And they're saying that most projects are failing. Um, and it's things like the project went over budget or over time. Those are kind of some simple ones. I would say the most important definition of failure um, from my perspective is that we didn't deliver the business objectives. And the business objectives can include time, right? So it's maybe I need to be able to see a million dollar return um, and I need to see it in one year's time, right? So actually projects need to go back. First of all, you need to set those up front um, or monitor them throughout the project. But then after you release this project, 
when the time is appropriate, go back and measure the business objective. Most companies that I work with are not doing that yet, um, but I think that's how we best decide are we spending our money, our IT dollars in the right way, and are we effective, or where are the bottlenecks, right? Um, so to me, the failure is about not delivering in that way. So not just being on time and on budget. I think that those are um, maybe more easy <laughs> to monitor, but I think the actual business value delivered is, is really the measure of success or failure. Great question, Scott. Thank you. Okay, next question here. This one's from Michael. Is the vision statement supposed to result in user requirements, functionality requirements, and business requirements? It seems like that for what, for whom type differentiator questions will lead to answers that are broader than just biz objectives. Um, I feel like, okay, so I think the vision statement might identify things like um, user requirements, and I think it potentially could lead you down the path to get to functional requirements, although probably not directly. And I think I see um, where you're going with that question that, you know, I can't write this vision statement and then suddenly know exactly what my scope boundary is. It could be much, much broader, and, and you know, it's visionary, right? That's the whole idea of a vision. So I don't think about a vision statement as leading me to those things. I think it more, um, to be honest, I think a vision statement is great to make sure everybody kind of has the same, you know, idea of where we're going. Um, so it's some little vision statement, if written well, could get people excited, you know, about the future over the next year or the next two years. Here's what we're doing, and this is why it's really exciting. So I think for some re some part of it is just really about the emotional aspect of having one of those on your project. That said, going through the exercise of it, what you will find is if you have everybody write their own, you're going to find out very, very quickly that your organization is not aligned on where we're going, right? They're not working towards a common goal and therefore probably not a high-performing team um, because they're driving in different directions. And so um, out of that, I think you can actually come up with leading yourselves down to, well, what, what are the right business objectives that we should do? I think it can help facilitate that process to get some of the top-level stuff. Um, and then everything else that we do on the project certainly needs to map back and be in line with that. But to me, this isn't where the measurement happens. It's really more about understanding what we're excited about doing and, and getting that team on the same page. Thank you. Next question here is from Pratik. What metrics is the best to determine which model can be adopted for a particular kind of organization? So, um, let me see if I, I'm not sure if I entirely understand that question, but let me try and take a stab at it and maybe you can follow up if you have a follow-on question with me via email. But um, there's, what I would say is that the models that I've presented actually should be able to be used in literally every type of organization. Um, and I think, you know, maybe you don't need to do all four of them, start with one of them, right, or two of them to get yourself started. So I don't think it's really about having metrics that tell me, yep, I should do this or not do this. Um, I think, let me talk about the metrics in a moment, but I think that all four of those scoping models are absolutely doable, right? If you've got multiple systems that are interacting, then you should be creating an ecosystems map. Um, if you've got, you know, groups of people or systems interacting with your system, a context diagram is absolutely appropriate um, to show what those interface points are, right? So, you know, the event list one, maybe isn't applicable to you. Um, the feature trees, I would say almost every single one of the projects that we work on, we would actually do a feature tree on um, just to get the high level picture of the features. So I don't think it's necessarily about the state of your organization um, that would lead you to on that path. Um, that said, you know, if you've not done any of them, pick like one and then pick another one to start with just to give yourself something manageable to actually tackle and be successful with. Um, and then in terms of metrics, there's tons and tons of metrics we can look at to see, hey, are we being successful or not? I just talked about business objectives being one. Um, but I think that you um, can look at some, just like with business objectives and success metrics on a project, um, you can look at your organization the same way. What are some high-level metrics that we're trying to do? Um, like maybe we're trying to be more successful in all of our projects and put some kind of measurement to that. I also might look at some interim things like, and this is a really low-level detail, but it is an indicator of where we're headed, right? How many defects do we have out of total, you know, based on size of project? Or how many missed requirements do we have? And starting to reduce those kinds of numbers. 
Um, Yasmina, I see one question here I'm going to grab real quick, which is how do you evaluate money value of every requirement? And I, I want to um, jump on that one because I, I hear this one a lot. Like if you think about how many requirements you have, that model that I presented called the objective chain could be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and the key is you don't do it on every requirement. You actually are going to want to um, group the requirements together into features, which is just sets of requirements that all relate, <laughs> um, and try and do this at the highest level that you can. All right. So, um, and sometimes that'll work. Sometimes you will need to go a little bit more granular, but you don't have to necessarily be consistent at the level which you're evaluating across the whole thing. Um, and then there will be other requirements that you just simply don't have to evaluate. Like it has to be there or we shouldn't even move forward. And you know, maybe you're building this external portal for your customers. You've got to have some level of security because of the kind of data that's going to be in there. There's no point in going through this analysis on a feature like that that you know has to be there. So you're going to do this analysis where it's not necessarily the obvious stuff. Just check yourself if you think it's obvious that it's really obvious. Um, but you know, I can, I can tell you that we've done it. We've done it on easily 50 different features, and it's not that bad to do. Um, but sometimes you can do it on far, far fewer. Thank you, Joy. A few more questions here. Um, a question here from Bill. And this question is about ways to visually represent Agile, versus, uh, Agile user stories. The feature tree you showed looks very close to what we want. Are there other options to show a map of user story titles and the relationship to each other? So, um, okay, so mapping user stories to one another. I think um, this is interesting. There, are, there are absolutely are. I'm just trying to think which way I want to point you. I think typically, and I didn't talk about this today, but one of the models that um, we use on literally almost every project again is process flows. Um, and we use process flows because they're really, really easy for our business stakeholders to understand. At a top level, they can you know, say, yep, that's how I do my job. And they just, they, that's what they're describing. And then what we can actually do is tie our user stories back to those process flows. Um, that's a very, very common link that we see. Um, so you're saying, yep, this particular process flow, and here's the four stories that map back to that process flow. So that would be relating process flows to user stories. That's one way you can do it. In terms of it, there's another model that actually helps you do it logistically. It's less visual, but you can use a thing called a requirements mapping matrix, um, also something like a traceability matrix, where I'm making that tie right there. And the requirements mapping matrix is basically a table that shows, you know, column one would be here's the process flow name, and column two would be the user story name. Column three could be um, individual functional requirements, too, that map right back to the user stories and then back to the process flow. So that's just one example of it. Um, I have some examples of this on our website if you want to grab them. There's some templates out there you could download too, and I'd be happy to answer further about that offline if that didn't make sense. But um, definitely a good question. I think it's, it's interesting. I find that we work on these projects with all these different models, and it's like how do you organize that? And it's, it's an information management problem that we're talking about there. It's not specific to our industry by any means. It's just got all these different pieces of information. How do I tie them together? And the requirements models, um, that we use very specifically have some points at which they tie together. You know, we talk about a data object in one is a data object in another, and that's a link between those two. Good question. Great, thank you. A couple more here. Um, let's see. Uh, Lewis would like to know, the different models cover different aspects of a system. Do you use all of them to finally help define the final scope? Great question. I. Um, Yes and no. So I'm going to answer that um, depends on the project. And I, well, okay. These are f four models that I just showed you. Um, the models book that we pointed you to has 22 different models in it. So I think of our toolbox as having 22 different models in it. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, I have yet to do a project where I've used all 22 models. Um, now, that said, I think that it's really important there's probably four to six models that we use on almost every project because they help bound that scope for us. Um, and they're that critical to the success of the project. So of these in particular, um, I'm going to say the ecosystem map is probably one of the most frequent ones that we do so we understand what are all the interfaces that we need to, to directly build, but then also think about where information is getting passed to. Um, context diagram, same thing. 
the feature tree itself, I think we use it on almost every project um, because it so easily communicates to a specific part of our audience, right? Again, executives love it. People ramping up on a project love it. Um, is a developer going to build from that? No, not at all. But you know, it does orient them very quickly to what the whole thing is. Um, one other thing that you, that you asked in that question I want to touch on is that you know all the models are basically, to your exact point, showing different perspectives um, on our system. We like to categorize our models. I didn't talk about it in the slides, but we have four categories of models, objectives, people, systems, and data. And that, um, we believe, are the, those are the four different perspectives on your project that you have to capture. And so on any given project, we would be picking models at least from each of those different categories. So we'd have at least a systems model and at least a data model and so on. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, folks, if you do have a question for Joy, type it in your group chat, send it, and we'll have her answer as many as we can while she's still with us. So we'll take this one from Michael. Does this quant analysis also apply to the question of option A versus option B if both satisfy the requirements you've set? Or an example he gives is, if your client has a business like using .NET rather than PHP, that results in higher resourcing costs, yet has minimal impact on the user regs or functional regs. Yeah, okay. So when you're doing the quantitative analysis, um, there's a bit of like thought work that certainly has to go into it. You know, if I've got option A and I've got option B, and both would satisfy the requirement, um, I mean, what I'm doing there is comparing effectively two different solutions. I'm going to put that in quotes because those solutions really could be requirements. Um, and so, you know, you're going to look at the, the net benefit on both of them. If you find out the net benefit is the same, you absolutely should be looking at the net cost as well to figure out, okay, well, one of those it maybe is cheaper or one of those is more aligned with our organization's strategy. Um, that model alone doesn't necessarily reflect all of that, but that's a piece of the analysis that you, you absolutely have to do. So I think that's a really, really good point. Um, you know, that model isn't the end-all, the all answer to whether you pick option A or B. It's just part of making sure you understand where option A and B, do they both equally satisfy the overall objective? Um, oftentimes they don't. Um, potentially, though, what you're getting into is comparing two different solutions, which isn't really the intent of the model, although it, you know, it can work. It's similar. Um, but you need to be looking at the cost side of that for sure. Good question. Excellent. We have two more questions here. Um, Pradeep would like to know, are there any measurements to categorize particular requirements as complex or simple? Hmm. I, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't necessarily have, I don't think I've seen anything along those lines. What I would say, um, it's interesting because complex and simple, like a requirement statement in itself, they really all should be simple. So this is probably talking, you know, Pradeep, you're probably asking more about, you know, is the um, solution behind the requirement complex or simple? And I think that, that um, I, that's certainly not something I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at in any detail because I feel like that's getting to the solution team's job to say, you know what, those two things on paper look both very simple, but building one of them is much, much harder than the other. And, you know, we jointly work with the implementation team to figure out that kind of stuff and guide our business stakeholders away from the ones that are more complex. Um, and then most commonly what I'm looking at when I see them give me a metric around that, it's going to be in terms of development costs or hours um, more than anything. Thank you. And our final question from Christina. Could you please repeat the four perspectives that must be addressed by the models in any given project? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Christina. I kind of snuck that in because it wasn't in the slide. So um, first of all, I'm going to tell you there's an acronym, OPSD, um, in case that helps. So objectives, and those are objectives tell us uh, why are we doing the project? What's the value in the project? Okay. Second one is people. So who is using the system? How are they using it? Second or third one is systems. So that is what are all the systems that we're interacting with and what's going on maybe inside of our system? system to systems interactions. Uh, and the fourth one is data. So what is the life cycle of the data that is in our system? So how's the data created? How's it transformed? How is it consumed? Right? Who uses the data? All right, so again, it's objectives, people, systems, 
data. Excellent. And those are all the questions I see. So with that, folks, we are going to say a very big thank you to you, Joy, for spending time with us today and for delivering just a fantastic presentation and sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. Great. Thank you, Yasmin. That was fun. Great questions, too, from the audience.